Hello, my name is John Herman, and I'm here to talk about social media and the arts. But first, I'm going to put on my skeptic's hat. You see, the world has changed dramatically in the past 10 years. We were waking up in a, in a strange, um, less than brave new world. Uh, you see, artists are posting their work on cluttered walls, subjecting themselves to sometimes nonsensical commenting uh, by friends, complete strangers. I'm talking about the Paris Salon of the mid-1700s. Now, these artists are not curated. They can submit. I have a friend named Vincent that um, within the, the 100 years that the Salon was active, he posted two works. He was expecting to be discovered to be appreciated. Now, Vincent um, only sold one work in his lifetime. So, um, friendship. Vincent was a friend. I'm going to talk about friendship, because I think social media might be undermining friendship. Uh, have you heard about this? There are people communicating with other people who are complete strangers through text and calling them friends across the country. The New York Times did a recent article on this in 1890 about how telegraphers are undermining friendship. And these telegraphers are ruining the English language. They're using like a text speak, abbreviations, which I feel like by the 1920s, English is just going to be completely unrecognizable. Film. I, there's been a, there have been times in my life that I considered myself a filmmaker. Um, I feel like kids today are taking the cinema experience, uh, you know, like you guys are all sitting together, you're laughing together because I'm funny. Um, <laughs> but they're losing it because they're watching a film uh, and making it a one-on-one -on -one experience. Have you seen this? Um, it all went downhill with the invention of the kinetoscope, <laughs> where you could go in and just drop a coin and film became this one-on-one -on -one personal experience. Um, okay, I'm going to stop being facetious. The thing is, uh, technological advances are not inherently amazing. What is amazing is how you use them, okay? I feel like the, the web is just full of opportunities, and there are just, I'm going to use my personal story. First of all, I was a filmmaker. Um, after college, I made a few films. The thing about filmmaking is that you work for more than a year on a project sometimes, and you, you, know, you beat the ground to get about 50 people, if you're lucky, to come into the theater for your premiere, and then it screens in the dark, and then you stand in the lobby. You don't have a name tag that says director, <laughs> and maybe someone says, wow, are you, are you the director? Pats you on the back says, that's, that's kind of cool. End of life experience. So I made a few documentaries, and after a while, uh, my camera admittedly began collecting dust. This was a camera that I had purchased that was more expensive than my car that I didn't put a lot of money into. So I dusted off my camera, and I said, I'm going to, I'm going to produce three minutes of video per week for fun and post it on this web. This was 2007. Uh, YouTube came to prominence in 2006. I called it the I. It was, you know, me looking at stuff. How basic. Um, my first week, I had seven views. Wow. <laughs> I was so excited because who were these seven people? <laughs> You know, hindsight's 2020. It could have been my dad just, you know, watching seven times, and then he was like, I'm not watching this anymore. But I got excited, and so I learned that consistency uh, collects an audience online. So uh, after 47 episodes, I had 10,000 regular viewers uh, views per week. And uh, I began to run out of not ideas, I ran out of clothing, because I wanted to wear the, a, a different thing for each episode. And so I offhandedly said, you know, I'm running out of clothes. What am I going to do? Here's my address. I started receiving clothes in the mail. <laughs> and I, I realized this web thing has potential. 
So what did I do? I stopped producing the eye. And several months later, I came back to the web with a brand new show that utilized this interactivity, me communicating directly with the audience. Uh, it was basically an interactive soap opera. And at the end of each episode, I came out in a tuxedo and discussed all the fine points of the mystery that was going on. There I am. Now, things got really weird when it became a conversation. My filmmaking became a conversation. When you give up the reins, and I did, I had viewers writing music, naming characters, writing scripts, and things got really weird fast. <laughs> but it was really exciting. We would have, for example, um, a character got hit by a car. Does she live? Does she die? They said, she's going to have a dream sequence. And so we wrote a dream sequence, uh, the audience and I. Um, the, oh, here's a good one. <laughs> we had someone lose a purse in, in, in an episode. And I said, hey, why don't you print out our lost purse for a fictional lost purse? Print out the, uh, the notice and, and, and hang it in your neighborhood. And maybe, and take a picture and send it to me and maybe I'll post it on the blog. That's New Zealand. That's Chicago. That's Washington, DC. Um, Seattle. <laughs> so this was uh, an, an incredible lesson as well. Uh, and so I did what you know, every artist does. I built a, a, a web layer in my basement, a, a broadcast facility in which I, I literally broadcast comedians, musicians, um, behind a, in front of a curtain, rather, that I had purchased, uh, I think, at Bed Bath & Beyond. And that was my only budget. And I started really, and, and actually my parents got theater seating for my basement. And I started getting really passionate about other people's artwork. And it became almost my thing, was that I would create projects around other people. Right when I started doing that, people started to come to me. A gentleman came to me and said, I'd like to have coffee with you and, and just, just talk about ideas. And I said, well, what have, what have you done? And he said, well, not much. I, I did enter a Heinz ketchup commercial contest. Um, and so me and a friend, we built these gigantic uh, food item heads. And I said, wow. <laughs> um, I promise you, within three days of meeting Ryan, uh, we were shooting in my backyard <laughs> a web series that we collaboratively, co collaboratively wrote. And the thing is that, you know, we came out with a few episodes. It was a musical, by the way. <laughs> Google it. Um, and it inspired other artists, illustrators, webcomic artists, started to produce work based on our characters, which was really quite exciting. And then another gentleman who's local, who's a horror blogger, said, um, a horror distributor wants to attract you know, people to their back catalog of horrors by having, uh, you know, quick horror web videos. Now, they thought that they were going to just follow this guy around with a camera at horror conventions, and, he would ha and it would be just really um, basic. But we crowdsourced an entire, like, horror show um, that each episode was only a few minutes long. And the thing about this is that everything was crowdsourced. By the way, if your stomach is being turned, that is, it's totally um, strawberry syrup. Sorry. It's tasty. So the people that you see, for example, when I say crowdsource, like I literally just posted through social media, um, be here at this time um, dressed as a zombie, for example, and you'll sign a release and you'll be in the show. And I didn't know if anyone would show up, but they did. And some of these people uh, became collaborators eventually, but I met them for the first time when they showed up at my house looking like they were going to eat me. Now, Having people seek you out for collaboration and me being so inspired by uh, their ideas, I realized that it might work both ways. So my wife and I were um, thinking of a movie for a one-minute film festival that was going to be in Harvard Square, literally outdoor screen. They were going to show 60 one-minute films over the course of an hour. Do the math. And we, had, we were going to do an Emily Dickinson poem in one minute. And she was gonna, uh, we were going to make a, a frog mask. And I was going to buy, uh, our only budget was I had to go to the, the pharmacy and get a green piece of paper so we could do stop motion animation. 
but we were driving around brainstorming about this, and the music that we were listening to was a prepared pianist named Hauschka, um, who prepared pian piano is when you stick things in the piano, and then he plays it, and it doesn't quite sound like a piano, but it sounds awesome. So I, I emailed uh, Hauschka, and then I contacted him through Facebook, Twitter, even MySpace, remember that? But I, I barraged him with like, contact, but he actually just contacted me within hours and said that this is, sounds excellent. I would love to do the music. So you just need to contact my label here. They know you're going to contact. And the label then, uh, we started talking to his label, and they, they were like, Hauschka loves it, so we love it. <laughs> so um, uh, $500 for licensing, and the $500, and you can choose anything in Hauschka's catalog. And uh, I was like, I, I explained that our dollar twenty-five went to that green piece of paper to Hauschka and said, "I'm sorry, we got really excited." Um, Hauschka then recorded something in his apartment, and within two hours of me telling him, "Sorry, Hauschka, that we went through all this, but we actually don't have a budget." Hauschka was so inspired by the idea that he just emailed me a unique track that appeared on his album three years later. Okay, <laughs> so. Um, I started, and I'm a, I'm a hobbyist. Uh, I'm, I, I, I love all kinds of arts. So I started to apply um, this philosophy to all different things. So I'm going to take you for a little tour. I applied it to music. I took um, 25 artists that I contact through different social media networks, one in France, uh, Mexico, Germany. Um, and I, I kind of uh, let them assume that all the artists and musicians were in their country, but that we were going to make this awesome album that was high concept because we were never going to meet each other. We were just going to use um, you know, social media, and, but we're going to use code names, and you have to go through me. So we made the album. Uh, you know, so the guy from Mexico would email me a drum track. I would give it to the person in Toronto. The Toronto uh, vocalist would sing. I'd send it to France. And then when the album came out, they found out that they had actually made an album with people all over the world. Now, when you come out with an album that has some excitement around it, the next step is you play out. You have a, a show. So we did. Um, this is a Boston art gallery. Uh, people flew in um, from New York and Seattle, but the more international members of the band, we had to stream via things like Skype um, and other live stream um, abilities, but we were able to perform songs uh, virtually uh, live for an audience. But I was sure to make sure it was in an art gallery, so it was framed well. People didn't want it to be in a concert hall and have people judge us. Anyway, I have so much stuff to tell you about. All right, um, I then applied this philosophy to playwriting. Um, what we have here is a Los Angeles playwright, a Canadian playwright, um, my friend in Portsmouth, and who just, he, he likes to figure out what I, how my head works, I guess. And uh, they collaboratively wrote a play using uh, the Google uh, Drive suite. I mean, it, it's, it's excellent. We embedded some video using uh, Google Plus Hangouts. Uh, it's real-time editing. But uh, what I then did was I, I've produced over, uh, probably I think, 67 short plays using this collaborative nature, where people are sending me things. I have volunteer directors, actors. We've produced multiple evenings, and I've been able to donate over $10,000 to local charities in my community, uh, all through volunteer work, through people, many of which I've never met and may never meet in my entire life. Uh, so then I applied uh, this kind of philosophy to novel writing, the immediacy, the we don't have to actually be face to face. We just need to know that we are all passionate about the same things. So we wrote a 24-hour novel, um, and I kind of orchestrated this thing where everybody logged into a digital um, real-time editor, and that our, our novel, where 23 authors were typing at the same time, so there, there, it was madness. Cursors are all over the place. Everybody's writing. It's very orchestrated. was broadcast on a, or projected rather, onto the walls of a art gallery in New Jersey. So you could walk into this room and see the novel being created. And then we had a 24th collaborator who was using a video live stream, and he was drawing the cover. Now, the thing is that he's drawing a cover to a book that's being written around him. So he has to like read it 
and then think about it, and then draw, and then go, oh, that's not what's going to happen, OK? <laughs> erase, erase, erase. So he, he um, illustrated throughout the day. And then within 24 hours, I released it for Amazon, Kindle, uh, Nook, and for iOS devices. So uh, the interactivity of that novel project, I hadn't witnessed since the Choose Your Own Adventure novels of my youth which I was a big fan of. So I created a Choose Your Own Adventure uh, novel online using Google Plus's interface, which really, really works. Um, so basically, I would post, say, a paragraph. I would have several comments. And then you would plus, or if for the more Facebook familiar, you would like one of the suggestions. And after, say, 15 likes or pluses, I, I would know which way to continue the story. 156 people participated in the first hour of my story, and I only needed like, what does it say, maybe five, 15 people to actually click it. So it, uh, people were excited by it. So um, Google Plus is uh, quite the playground. Now, every time something new happens, people are like, ah, something new. I look at things that are new as opportunity and excitement. Um, so when Google Plus came out, I created a game show, kind of like Cash Cab, where you're in a video chat and suddenly, oh, surprise, you're in a game show. The guy's got a tuxedo. He's giving away Beats by Dre and uh, Kindle Fires. Um, I got a sponsor. I actually got a bow tie sponsor from a fashion designer in San Francisco after my first episode. <laughs> so created this game show. I also created a talent show with my friend Matt. This, what you're seeing, is someone performing on my talent show. That is Stian. He is uh, the all night, uh, the overnight security guard at the Oslo Norway Botanical Gardens. He's on duty in uniform. He's double handcuffed himself, and he's got a key in his mouth, <laughs> and trying to escape. <laughs> but the priceless moment here is my face, because I know that this is awesome. <laughs> so. Um, I know a lot of my examples are facetious. I've been able to work with artists from all over the world. I also work with individuals, organizations, and businesses. But no matter who I'm working with, uh, the point still remains that technological advances are not inherently amazing. What is amazing is how you use them. And the question is, how are you going to use them? Thank you. <laughs>